so much, everyone. Awesome, just remember to hit record. All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I think we're all, with the exception of Alan Cinnamon on the West Coast, but um, thanks again for being here. I think most of us were here for part one, but we're so excited to um, have Dr. Musu back with us for part two of our care dialogue conversations. Um, I know that a lot of you have already gone into the, um, the shared um, link to be able to add case studies and scenarios. So we're excited to be able to dive further into the conversation and um, really more talk about like the parallels between like the work that we're doing um, and how we can continue working with students in this space. So um, let's get started. I know Dr. Musu has um, a lot of content to go through um, and to guide the conversation. So excited to um, have her kick it off. start sharing. And then I just have to remember how to unmute myself because that is Zoom life, right? Like what would the day be without somebody talking on mute? How's it going, everybody? It's so good to see you all. Many of you again. So thank you for coming back. If this is our second actual session together um, and welcome to those of you who I am just meeting. So um, today we're going to focus on application of some of the things we learned um, at our last session. Um, it's okay if you weren't present for the last one, you can kind of jump right in. I do want to, um, before we jump into our discussion and application, we'll do like a quick recap of what we talked about last time. And then I also want to give you an opportunity to share if you've done any observations or learning or development since our last session together too. So um, a little bit more about me, just a reminder. So um, I'm Dr. Musu Davis. I'm originally from Western New York, and I met the wonderful Cheryl Martinez while we were uh, colleagues in graduate school at Syracuse University. So my master's is in higher ed administration, um, and my PhD is in urban education. So um, really, I focus on the experiences of underrepresented students, especially high achieving students at urban institutions. Um, and I'm excited to work with lots of different kinds of folks, just like you, who do great work to support students learning and development and enhance their college experience inside and outside classrooms. Um, so I'm really jazzed to be here to get to work with you again for our second session. So what we will do today, I'll kind of give you a sense of our agenda. Uh, we'll start with a brief recap. I want to make sure that we have um, a good idea of what we covered last time and kind of create a basis for what we'll do today. And um, I also have some additional resources, so I'll make sure that I send those along after we're all done today, because I'm sure that one of you is going to say something brilliant and I'll have to go find an article and I want to share that with you and link that all together. Um, so I'll share that when we're all done with everything. And then we will focus most of our time on the case studies and the breakout. So I think the sentiment at the end of last session was we want more time to talk about these things and there's not enough time for discussion. So we will make most of our time together discussion today uh, and leave lots of time for reflection um, and kind of reconsideration and think about how we can strategize for solutions for the cases that you all offered. Thank you again for offering your cases. And then we'll have some time for general Q&A um, or we can push that time to do more discussing. Totally up to you. Kind of do whatever you feel works. Okay. If you have questions, you can throw them in the chat. I will do my best to monitor that as well. And uh, I'll just jump in to our recap. So in our first session, we were really focused on self-reflection and uh, creating a basis on which we were reflective of our own identities, um, both our personal identities and our social identities. And in particular, we were thinking about creating a sense of self-awareness um, about our own lenses and the things we think or feel and how we perceive you know, the world, but especially our students and the campus environments we're working in. And we're doing that in order to help us become more attuned to the way that we can be more culturally sensitive with our students, right? So by having a good understanding of who we are and how we think about things and what we're contributing to those dynamics we create with our students and in our campus environments, um, we can enhance the way we do the work that we do. And I think the work that all of you are doing is so important. I mean, working with underrepresented students to enhance their uh, orientation to STEM careers and help them feel more comfortable and confident and be you know, the folks who really offer that dynamic sense of um, commitment and confidence in their STEM identities is super important. So some of the tools that we talked about last time um, included the self-identity 
um, wheel. So you had that in your first worksheet. Um, we also talked about self-reflection of our identities and lenses in relation to students in campus. So some of our small group discussion was thinking about how um, we became more aware of different identities we had, or if we could think of situations where our identities were particularly um, impactful to the interactions we were having with the student or in a different campus environment. Um, and some of the cases that you guys offered also offer uh, those kinds of intersections or ideas as well, thinking about our own identities and when we were sensitive about them or developed them or became aware of them uh, and what role they play in our interactions or our support. We also talked about intersectionality, and I list it as a tool here, um, in particular because we're thinking about it as a kind of a theoretical lens, and it gives us some perspective on the ideas that folks are having more than one, um, folks live at the nexus of more than one social identity, and also um, within systems of oppression, that means that they're not just Black, or they're not just Latino, or they're not just their age, is that all of these different oppressions in society um, or these structures in society that we're functioning in play a role in how they experience the world. Um, and in particular, our classrooms and our advising spaces and our support spaces with them. And so being aware of that is really helpful. Um, and I was excited because most of you had heard about intersectionality before our session. So that's really great. And um, I think it's a good thing to keep in our toolkit. So that's kind of our general information about what we talked about last time, the tools and the big ideas. Some of your homework was to uh, see if there were things that you could observe in your daily life or um, thinking about ways that you can increase your awareness or sensitivity by exposing yourself to different resources or um, doing a brief article review or just kind of like, you know, a casual search on the internet to learn more about sense of belonging or identity. Um, are there resources or lessons that you learned that maybe you want to share? Um, and you can share them in the chat or you can unmute, raise your hand and unmute, and we can call on you and talk more about it. Just a reminder, your homework's not graded. So it's okay. Do you want to work through it? Go ahead, Becca. Okay, I'm on someone else's computer. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that this last weekend I saw the opera Omar, which is about a, a Muslim slave uh, who was abducted from, I think, what's currently Somalia and uh, taken to the United States and enslaved there and his whole experience. And I had no idea until I had was reading some of the information about it that about a quarter of the people who were taken as slaves were Muslim. So I know that that's another area that I need to expose myself to more. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else want to share? Oh, I see the chat. Okay. So one thing I did uh, last week was we have a Center for Middle Eastern Studies on our campus. And I went to a virtual teach-in on the conflict that's happening in the Middle East right now. And it was really based on historical interactions um, in the parties involved. And I learned so much. And it's wild because I feel like I'm a well-read person, but I was feeling in this moment and kind of our global political landscape that I did not have as much information as I wanted. Um, to be a good advocate or educator. Like I just, I felt like under educated. Um, and so I was excited that the university offered an opportunity like this to learn um, from folks who are experts in the area. But I also appreciated that it was really grounded in like historical context. Um, and that gave me a lot of insight that I hadn't had before. And so thinking about the lots of different kinds of groups that are there um, and issues of nationalism or nationality and, um, you know, religious identity and all of these things kind of intersecting for folks who are involved um, geographically in the conflict was just a really wonderful learning experience for me. Um, someone else mentioned in the chat 
I've been doing a considerable amount, about, amount of research on Palestinian history, guided by many of my Muslim students. Great. Thanks for sharing, Cami. Yeah, um, I really also like that you're taking the hint from your students, right? Or your students are what is kind of motivating your desire to learn more. Um, that's really powerful. Yeah. Have you told your students that you've learned more yet? Because they will be delighted to hear that they are the reason that you've explored, you know, learning more. We have been having many uh, of our check-ins rooted in how they are reacting, how their families are behaving differently. I have several Jordanian students who are very affected right now. Mm -hmm. um, and they are actually my students that are at transfer schools. So they have told me, you know, nobody at my university talks to me about this. You're the only person who has asked me what this is like for me, um, which I found so alarming on so many levels. So um, yeah, no, I, I felt very lucky to uh, have them point me to some valuable resources, like you said, grounded in history mm -hmm. to really see, because I think it's very easy for us to say, well, I don't have enough information and kind of absolve myself mm -hmm. with my ignorant blanket mm -hmm. <laughs> that's comforting me, you know, but like, I, I think this is not a time to claim ignorance, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. So folks are welcome to put more in the chat. Uh, thank you for those of you who shared. I do encourage everyone to take advantage of this learning opportunity, particularly the self-reflection, uh, to think about the things that you didn't know you didn't know um, as we're talking today, but then also, you know, kind of as you're absorbing life outside of the Zoom screen, like what are the things that you're being exposed to or that you're seeing on the news or that your students are sharing with you that you just had no idea that you didn't know about that thing um, and really push yourself to learn a little bit more. So um, I will share several resources with you after this session, um, partly based on some of what you've also shared today. Um, but I do want to make sure that I give you um, just a reminder that we also talked about research on STEM identity um, and race and sense of belonging, in particular, a lot of research from um, Dr. Terrell Strayhorn. One of the resources I'm going to share with you um, that I learned from over the past week is a series of um, webinars focusing on um, an, a new volume, I think was published earlier this year, um, focused on sense of belonging and the different kind of iterations of what that looks like for different kinds of students, particularly underrepresented students, um, and different environments of campus community. So not just predominantly white institutions, but then talking about historically um, Hispanic serving institutions and other like HBCUs and things like that. So it's a little bit more inclusive than I think the prior research had been, which is really helpful, I think, for your context. And then also we talked about social and personal identities. Um, and I've got several links to share with you on that. So if you wanna do more reflection or understanding of kind of what identity means and how that manifests for you and for your students, you'll have a chance to enjoy um, or engage with that. Okay, so we're going to jump into our case studies. Do we have any questions so far? No? Okay, let's do it. Let's do all the talking. So I'm going to put the case study document in the chat so that you have it. Um, this is the same one that you submitted to if you submitted a case study. But what I've done is uh, pull together the ones that were submitted and put them into scenarios so that we can review them with a little bit more focus. So there are three cases that we'll talk about um, and you'll have a chance to choose which one you want, though we have a very small group. So we'll see if we need to split up or not or if we just wanna go through all of them together. Uh, but the first one, this is case A uh, and the scenario is spotlighted. So a student comes to you for advising. When you ask how classes are going, they tell you about their introductory biology class. Most of your students have described this professor as friendly and approachable because they like to infuse humor into class discussion. But your advisee feels they're often at the receiving end of the professor's comments or jokes about their hair, but they don't point this out about anyone else's. So that's the first scenario, okay? The next one is, um, someone is building a great working relationship with a colleague, um, at the community college where they work. I'm excited about my role because I identify with the students we support in a lot of ways, uh, which makes me excited because I feel empowered about my identity and reassured that I can provide guidance and connect with them when they're facing similar experiences or feelings because I was in their shoes at one point. 
My colleague is supportive and good at their job, but students don't seem to connect with them in the same ways as with me, probably because of the visible differences. I want to encourage them without making them feel self-conscious about their own identities. So this one's about encouraging a peer um, or helping a colleague through a scenario. And then the third one, option C, is I'm so aware of my identities on campus and I'm struggling to be my authentic self at work. I find myself putting in a lot of effort to be attentive to office activities. When we have staff meetings, sometimes I feel like I am being mindful and reflective on the content being presented, but I'm noticing that at times my not speaking up the way others do gets misconstrued as being withdrawn or unapproachable, which is not how I describe myself. I just need a moment to digest things sometimes. When I am vocal on team projects, however, my colleagues remark at how shocking it is that I know the material and can keep up. I'm the only woman and woman of color in our unit, and I just feel like this isn't working. So those are the three cases. The first one is focused on a student and supporting them through advising. The second one is working with a colleague. And the third one is also reflective of a colleague. Okay. So you can kind of think which one you're excited about or, you know, really want to delve into. Um, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's eight of us. We could do, uh, let's do three rooms. Um, Cheryl, would you like to join a room? Yes, please. Okay, so we'll do three rooms. Um, we can do like groups of three and um, I'll split you up. And these are the choices or the questions that I want you to focus on. Um, so you may have gotten the worksheet. I can put that in the chat too, with some more guidance questions or guided questions. But essentially what I want you to focus on in your small group discussion in your breakout room is what could be the most salient identities for the people involved. In some cases, they're kind of specific. In other cases, they're not. And you can feel free to kind of be creative in terms of um, what you think might be at play or the focus there. And then the other question that's really important is what are some strategies for a more inclusive environment and a dynamic that fosters belonging. Because ultimately our goal is that our colleagues and ourselves and our students feel a sense of belonging or connection in these spaces that we're navigating together, particularly learning environments, right? Because we know how important a sense of belonging as we discussed last time is for students' persistence and their commitment to their academic plans and to staying in college, okay? So I'm going to open up the breakout rooms. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see where the breakout rooms are. Then I'm gonna open them. <laughs> Do we have any questions before we go around? Before we hop out? Can we copy the um, prompts into the chat? Same with like the questions that we'll be addressing. Yes, how about I pull? I'll pull them into the chat now. I'll do that before we go to our breakout rooms and then everybody will have them. So here are the main questions I want you to think about in your groups. And then here is I'll send out the um, document also. Okay, so you can get started with this and I'll pop into your rooms. So here are the rooms. You can choose your own. If you can't see it or it won't let you go, let me know and I can move you. So everybody is joining a room. Is it letting you? There we go. for the case that you prefer. Anybody need help moving? Amalia, can I, oh, there you go.
Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I had to get back That's to my okay. desk before I could do this. I uh, I have a, a puppy who is not feeling well. And oh, I I'm sorry. Deal with that. Um, so I've been listening, but I just got back to where I can. Totally okay. Um, so we are, I... um, can you see yeah. the link in the chat with for the case studies? Yes. Okay, so you can pick one that you're interested in and then you can hop into a room. It looks like we need somebody else in room C with Cami. Cool. Um, how do I, how I do can I, you. that would be awesome. Right. I'll assign you to KC. See you in a bit. Yeah, thank you. Welcome back, welcome back. Yay. Listen, room C, room yeah. C was popping. I didn't even come back to the other rooms. We had such a good conversation. Throughout the party, you know. <laughs> How was that for you, Myra? Was that helpful? Yeah, I, um, again, I feel like me, Cheryl, and Becca definitely have had some experience in this and hearing like how they um, would have either reacted or um, the steps they would have taken to help a student in that situation um, was very helpful because my experience was a little different because I'm a big chicken. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's what I should have done. <laughs> oh, Myra, you're not a chicken. I totally am. You have no idea. <laughs> but but awareness helps us develop the muscles and courage to speak up yes. right in the future yes. we'll get there yes. exactly we will get there, uh, there. <laughs> she is Myra four or five years ago versus Myra now it's very different that's good see you don't even see yourself growing baby steps baby steps <laughs> wonderful yes. Okay, everybody, I hope you had some dynamic discussions. I was just saying that I was in um, room C and I had planned to leave, but then we got really deep in discussions. <laughs> so you all have to tell me how it went in your rooms. Can we start with, um, let's do case B first and um, tell us about the identities that you felt were most salient for the folks involved. And then what are some strategies that you talked about? You can just unmute and go for it. I could chime in. I think our group, like we we all kind of had the same sentiment around like building spaces, um, safe spaces through the leadership, um, really making sure that um, the structure is being communicated from top down to really enforce that it's, you know, a safe space, welcoming space, and then have people partake. Um, and then feel free, Al, to jump in. Yeah, I, I think um, I think we brought up, well, I know I brought up uh, talking about um, faith and, and religion um, in, um, in the case study, mm -hmm. potentially. Um, I, like I said, I think many of folks on this call are West Coast. Um, so uh, we in this here in the South <laughs> consider those, those folks very liberal. <laughs> mm. But um, we have um, we have some structures in in North Carolina um, that um, are kind of assumed mm -hmm. and um, and people tend to think of you a certain way before they really know you some biases, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and um, sometimes we have to navigate those and you have to be d delicate how you navigate those, especially in the workspace. Um, Cause people assume, oh yeah, you know about this or yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I'm like, no, not really. But just because of, you know, how you present mm -hmm. or maybe culturally, you know, your cultural background, um, obviously people assume. And um, so, so yeah, we, I, that's kind of what I brought up about just being, um, culturally aware and um, not feeding into some of those biases, um, particularly as it pertains to faith. And uh, I mentioned a student that I had a conversation with last night um, about um, going into the sciences and her family, not necessarily understanding some, some aspects of that, especially how it pertains to um, treatment of children, um, medically, mm -hmm. medical treatment, and mm -hmm. in particular um, children on the autism spectrum. 
So, um, so you had an interesting conversation about that too, and and just how um, how different people of different faiths obviously um, will approach things differently, and um, sometimes we assume that folks are approaching them the same way we are. Thank you for acknowledging that. So, what kinds of strategies did you think about in your group for your colleague? I think, um, I think uh, let's see, was it um, Rebecca had mentioned that, yeah, earlier, just um, it's kind of hard to do that with students. So it was, we, she mentioned about how you do that with coworkers, but um, it's harder with students in that sense. Um, and these students, I don't really know that well, because mm -hmm. I was taking um, a, a, a colleague's class to a career fair. But um, so I, I think part of it gets just really begins with getting to know the students for who they are and building relationships. I think it's the best thing you do with any anything, but um, building relationships and really getting to know people and stepping outside your comfort zone and getting to know and understand people from where they are um, and from their own um, perspectives, especially from their identities. Um, and again, not being um, being as safe as you can, um, I, and we all carry biases mm -hmm. into interactions. So mm -hmm. just being as safe as you can and letting them know, hey, I didn't understand that, I didn't know that, or I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. um, being safe and sincere as you possibly can. But I think it starts with um, just really showing that you're a human being and oh, I'm just trying to get to know you as a human being and you just do the same for me. And then yeah. you can kind of bridge onto whole host of other things. Yeah, I think my. students love and maybe colleagues too once you've started to build a relationship but students love when we throw an I don't know out there they just they just eat it up it's like oh here's an opportunity for me to teach this person who seems to know all these things something that they don't know they love it and I think especially I really like the language that you modeled um saying you know I didn't know this thing and then following up with can you tell me more about your experience with that or can you tell me more about where on campus I can learn more about that um, one of the things I was thinking when I reviewed this case uh, was encouraging my colleague to go to student events that my students mentioned they were going to. So if we know that the holidays are coming up, ask them, you know, like, what are you doing for winter break? Or like, are you you're like, does your family celebrate any holidays? Are you going to do that? You know, while you're here on campus, like, can you tell me more about what the local community center is doing? Those kinds of things. Um, and students love when they see you outside your office. <laughs> it's just so exciting when they see you at, you know, their community center, or their cultural center or at the student center. And you're like doing human things. Like, I love running into students at Target because they're like, you shop? I'm like, <laughs> like what I need to do too, you know? But they think about us kind of in this space, right? Like we are just the advising dean or we are just the, you know, advisor or we are just the instructor. And so it's really wonderful to give them an opportunity to see us learning, actively learning, especially if it's a space where you're going to be the minority in some way, racially, religiously, spiritually, socially, right? Visibly, whatever you can do to help model that for students and show them that you're trying, they'll usually give you you know, they'll give you a chance, right? They'll give you a little, a little grace. Great. So you guys came up with some great ideas. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what about group A, scenario A? This was the one with the student who comes to you for advising. How did your conversation go, Myra? Um, me and Cheryl, I think, jumped in right away because of personal experiences too. Um, Cheryl shared one of hers and then I shared one that I had uh, worse back when I was at a campus, a student had come and uh, shared that they felt that certain comments being made uh, were kind of on the down low being aimed at them. And um, I shared that I was kind of taken back because I had also had a similar um observation but being that I am a chicken <laughs> I didn't know what to tell the student and but we both kind of talked about it and but again came I, I just out of fear of like oh my gosh you know if we go and we say something are we starting something the fear of like 
okay, if I send them, you know, to, to a higher up, you know, it, cause it can just, it can go from like bad to worse, or it can go from bad mm-hmm. to good, but you just don't know. And me being paralyzed with fear and not knowing how to direct the student and then the student also being, well, what do I do? You know, it just wasn't a good combination. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, Becca also shared a recent experience she had and she had advised the student, um, found resources uh, for her to use and go to uh, to be able to bring up this concern that the student had um, and which, you know, now thinking about it I was like yeah I probably should have done that (laughs) um but but with that and uh, we had talked about how again it can be scary like sometimes Cheryl said you know it can be scary just to come up to us and share something that's affecting them which Mm -hmm. um I hadn't shared with them I always felt that when a student was you know felt that they could bring something up to me I just felt like wow like you trust me enough to to share this with me which I think is big in itself Mm -hmm. um but um Cheryl said so to be able to go maybe even to a higher up can be even scarier so instead of just sounding them like themselves you know going together with them and bringing up or if the student doesn't feel comfortable in that kind of scenario either you know bringing it up yourself to a higher up or Mm -hmm. having pulling in that um, professor, whoever it may be, to have um, a wider conversation about, you know, uh, the the issue at hand. Mm-hmm. Great. We talked a little bit about the fact that in this situation, um, even though the student felt like negative comments were being made, um, sometimes it can be uh, what a faculty or staff or, or someone thinks is a positive comment but it's othering you or the student and making them even more sensitive about Mm -hmm. the compliment, right? So Mm -hmm. just if a student is willing to bring that up to you, it's something that is bothering them. So whether they want to continue delving into the conversation with you, or even if it's just like, they are like, I don't want to do anything with about it, but it plants a seed in your head as admin. Mm -hmm. When I go to our next advisory board meeting, it makes sense that we can have care dialogue circles like this. Maybe this is something that we can implement on our team or in our math department. Um, Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about the fact that um, it's just very interesting. Like when you are a teacher, like K through 12, like so much time is spent on student development theory and um, pedagogy and in addition to curriculum and how you instruct a class. But Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes when we are at like, the community college or the four-year, your instructor is such an expert in their field that they're assumed that they can teach it, but not necessarily, you you can talk about the topic all day, but you can't connect with students. So how are you teaching this, right? Yes. Um, So that's a big part of it too, that makes sense that students are not always being, like like that part of students is not always being thought about by the instructor and like, that's not okay, right? So like what changes Mm -hmm. can we make to start bringing to the table to further support students. Mm-hmm. Great. So wrapped up in some of that, you acknowledged um, some strategies that you would employ immediately, particularly from your positions of power on your campus or in your um, on your team, which is great. I think um, acknowledging that some of us have the ability to go affect change immediately, to go address the thing that we observed or a student shared with us, um, directly is really awesome because we do in some way, all of us do have some kind of, um, power in a way that the student doesn't in those kinds of scenarios. Right. And whether or not we feel comfortable or courageous enough (laughs) to go to that professor, right. Or if we feel that's appropriate or not, um, or to walk with a student to, you know, the Dean of Students office or whichever unit on your campus is the best suited to connect them with. Um, it's kind of an aside. We can like, you know, flex those muscles or develop those muscles so that when we're, you know, we're in the moment, we we can do it. But I, I appreciate the kinds of things that you were thinking about um, in consideration of the student's experience. And I also, uh, when I popped into your room, heard you sharing some of your own personal experiences related to feeling, you know, singled out um, and what that's like in a classroom space and kind of how it 
how it plays a role in how you modify your own behavior, because then you're thinking to yourself as an individual. So is everything I do going to be under a spotlight? And then that kind of, you get caught up in that students get caught up in that protective mode or that, you know, concern mode, and it impacts how they do in the course and it impacts their sense of belonging. And it impacts whether or not they want to stay or continue talking to that instructor or keep stay in the class. Right. Um, so I, I really appreciate the insights that you shared. So I'm going to switch gears to group C. Um, and while you're talking, I'm just going to put in the um, chat the link to submit feedback. Um, not necessarily for this moment, because we want to listen to Cinnamon and um, Kami as they share what their reflections were, but I just don't want you to forget to do that. Um, go ahead, Cinnamon and Kami, can you share a little bit more about what you, um, what strategies you thought about? We can start there. Um, you guys had the group that was helping a colleague? Yes. Um, Cinnamon, is it okay if I go first? Because you challenged my assumptions so beautifully, and I kind of want to set it up so that they experience it the way that we did it. So go for it. Um, so the three things that we picked out from the prompt were that it was a colleague that was struggling because they felt that they had to put a lot of effort in um, to present uh, action in a certain way. Like sometimes they're being mindful and reflective, but it looks like or is misconstrued as being unapproachable or uncaring. And um, when they are vocal, the colleagues make remarks oh, you know, we're surprised that you're able to keep up. And like, they couch it with that like weird insult. And so uh, they, the person mentioned that they were the only woman of color in their workplace. And here I go, out the gate, this is the black woman. This is terrible because we expect black women to take the world on their shoulders. They have to save the world. You have to be at the forefront of every social movement. You have to behave perfectly. You have to be at the crux of many impossible standards that fight against stereotypes that already exist, um, you know, including, but not limited to like not playing into the angry black woman trope, right? And uh, when I was thinking about strategies, I had a lot of suggestions for the team, for the people around her to speak up and challenge this culture and say something. And I really struggled with what to say to her because, um, my personal biases came in in that moment, I did consider a conversation with HR or what it would look like to take it up the chain. And one of the things I mentioned was HR doesn't exist to protect individuals. It exists to protect the institution. So whether or not something is legal, encouraged in the handbook, doesn't actually mean that action will come from it. And there are many people who may choose not to pursue that from a place of protection. And mm -hmm. so I was really looking for feedback on like, well, what what can I do besides just taking my energy and positive anger and putting it into my own life, my own conversations, my own workplace? How can I show up and support her? And then Cinnamon came in and my head spun all the way around. <laughs> so if you're ready. Um, yeah. So I just because I work at a Native American serving institution, I am highly aware that for everyone else, when we say person of color, they assume black, or maybe they think about the fact that Hispanic people also exist. Um, and no one ever thinks Native American. They are almost invisible from all discussions on people of color. And of course, when you say person of color to me, um, you know, that's half my student body is Native American, so that's what I think. Um, you know, there's like two black students on campus. Um, welcome to Durango. <laughs> Um, and so, um, yeah, this whole culture of just like being surprised that somebody is intellectually competent um, felt really familiar to me because because of decades of systematically underfunding Native American schools, mm -hmm. um, you know, there is a very strong bias um, that people who are Native American just don't have a good education and can't keep up academically. Um, and it can, you know, for my, especially my female students, it, you know, they feel a lot of pressure to fight that and to prove that they are in fact intellectually competent. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle, you know. No, and I loved when you said, you were like, well, I want to check in with her. What does she want? I, that truly did not cross my mind 
to say, where are you in the place of what you seek action? And I don't quite remember what you had said after that. Um, yeah, I, I guess I was just saying, you know, I mean, this person is living in a hostile work environment that they probably can't fix. And if I'm going to have a conversation with them to try to give them any advice, um, I need to know what's their bandwidth. Do they want to fight? Do they want to stand up and say some feisty things or start, you know, recruiting other people to say some feisty things? Do they just want strategies for coping with the stress, for just surviving being in this lousy situation? Do they want to talk about resources for exploring a changed workplace? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how to give this person advice if I don't know you know, which of those things they're ready for, so. Yeah, and I thought that was very insightful to think about what is the action that the person at the center of the story wants to take. Um, because I think, so as a supervisor mm -hmm. who has to go through mandatory HR training virtually every year, I'm like, this is harassment, this is not okay. I know the channel, like I know how we file a complaint. I know how we, you know, how we protect the person. I'm, I'm like ready to go. But the reality is this person may not want any of that. This person may not trust that that's going to come out the way they would prefer. That person may not trust that they're actually going to be protected as you two were saying. And so despite my knowledge of the resources, I have to think about what is the best resource at this time or being sensitive to what the person at the center of the story feels is the best course of action for them or they feel most comfortable with. And can I do that with them? Can I be their partner or their ally in this process? Or is it just I'm providing resources and I'm a listening ear until they've decided what works for them if they want to take action? They may have just resolved that this is how it's going to be because maybe it's been this way before in other environments and this is just what it's like for me, right? And so even that position is something that I would have to work on as a supervisor or as a colleague and you know, it's this person's choice. Um, but being aware again of our own biases and our own lenses and how we view the situation, hearing about it from the outside might be really different from the person who's experiencing it. So I wanna thank all of you so much for your very insightful reflections on these different cases. And I also want to thank you for submitting the cases because I know that they're grounded in, you know, lived experience and um, cases that you've encountered in your own professional or personal life. So um, in particular, because it required some self-reflection and some personal sharing, I really want to affirm um, my appreciation for your willingness to be vulnerable in that way. And also your willingness to share with each other your reflections on, you know, some of these are kind of sensitive. And um, we, I think we manage that really dynamically and supportively. So thank you so much for your participation today. And uh, thanks so much for having me with you. Yay. Huge round thank of applause. You. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Musu, for your time. I know that um, this was a small group today, but definitely appreciate everyone's participation. Um, great conversation. Um, I know that Dr. Musu will be sending some resources um, after today's conversation. So I'll be sure to send um, the recording link along with those resources out to the group um, and appreciate you all taking the time to be here because I know this time of year is really tough for everybody. So thanks for making this a priority. Um, enjoy the rest of your Thursday and we'll see you all soon. Thank you, everyone.